Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It bears mentioning that today is match day for residency applicants and programs across the country, and we are absolutely thrilled with our next incoming class of interns in internal medicine. I'd like to offer a heartfelt thank you and congratulations to all who helped with the recruitment and interviewing process in an unprecedented year of challenge. This week, our speaker is Dr. Keith Elkon, the Mart Manick Lucille T. Henderson Endowed Professor and Division Head in Rheumatology and Immunology here at the University of Washington. He completed his medical schooling at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, and went on to complete medical residency in London and later fellowship at Cornell University in New York. As a physician scientist, Dr. Elkon's research has produced over 240 publications in peer-reviewed journals, his lab seeks to better define the genetic and molecular basis for autoimmune diseases like lupus and arthritis in order to devise new and more effective forms of therapy in lupus and other related diseases. Specific areas of research in his lab include better characterizing the type 1 interferons and the role of the innate immune system in the pathogenesis of systemic lupus and other related autoimmune disease like scleroderma, polymyositis, and Sjogren's syndrome. His work connects abnormalities in cellular death leading to provocation of the innate immune response, but also additionally looks at uh, environmental triggers like sunlight, both as a trigger and as a modulator of immunity. Dr. Alcon, thank you so much for taking the time this week to be with us as our grand round speaker. Uh, I will be moderating the chat as usual. And so to the audience, feel free to use the feature at any point during this presentation and we will take note for a, a brief question and answer session at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about the, the power of sunlight today. Um, and here are a couple of disclosures. Um, and humans of all persuasions have since ancient times worshiped the sun. And this is for very good reason. The sun is good for crops. It's good for uh, humans, uh, the most notable effects of which are uh, a good mood and strong bones. So the, probably the best known metabolic effect of sunlight is to promote uh, vitamin D uh, conversion and uh, bone health. What is much less known is the effect of sunlight on the immune system. And that's really what I'm going to be concentrating on in this talk today. So I'll give you a couple of brief introductory slides about what sunlight means in terms of its effect on skin. So uh, we have uh, the very short wave uh, light called UVC that um, really is filtered out by the atmosphere and we don't have to worry too much about that. On, uh, on health effects. We have a, then a short wave UV that does actually penetrate. It's, uh, the depth of penetration into the skin is actually less than UVA, um, but it does cause, it is an important inducer of sunburn in DNA damage. And we'll be talking a lot about that uh, in the next few slides. Um, and then you have UVA, which is the longer UV, UV uh, longer wavelength, uh, that penetrates much more deeply uh, and can also cause important uh, immune effects. And then for visible light, we generally don't uh, worry too much about that um, because it doesn't seem to cause a lot of skin damage. Okay, the other bit of introductory information I need to convey is um, the immunology of the human skin. Now, this is a very simplified diagram, but just to introduce you to the major players here. So if you remember your immunology, you have uh, two major components. One is innate immunity, innate immune cells. So that includes macrophages, dendritic cells, and a number of other innate immune cells which you won't be talking about. Um, and the Langerhans cells is a, is a specialized dendritic cell that's present in the epidermis of the skin. Now, the important points to remember about the, the dendritic cells, so they are the antigen presenting cells. So that if there's any inflammation or damage in the skin, they take up antigens and present them to T cells. The T cells are distributed both in the epidermis and the dermis, uh, 
and they are very important in um, the longer term effects of immune stimulation. Okay, so what happens when you, you, you have a nice spring day like we maybe had in the first couple of days this week? You go out into the sunshine for 15 minutes, a half hour, just to feel good. Well, you actually get uh, thousands of DNA breaks. That sunshine in a normal individual will cause a lot, actually a lot of DNA damage. The cells see that DNA damage and in order to uh, just get rid of themselves, they undergo this program form of cell death called apoptosis. You can see that um, in these, uh, the white arrows show you these uh, cells undergoing cell death. Um, those are called, also called sunburst cells. Those cells fragment and little bits of DNA and debris and cell fragments uh, get taken up by phagocytes in the skin and generally after a couple of days that, that goes away. But of course the effects of, uh, sun, of sunlight and UV radiation on the skin are much more complicated. And when you dig down deeper, you see that the UV light generates chromophores that have a multitude of effects. And I just want to highlight a couple here. So there's uh, direct DNA damage, as, as I already mentioned. There's generation of reactive oxygen intermediates, which cause oxidation of the nucleic acids. And then there, there are um, protective effects because if these didn't occur, of course, every time you've got exposed to sunlight, you would have a ton of inflammation. So to offset that, we have um, activation of tryptophan, ultimately leading to generation of prostaglandin E2, and that in turn induces T regulatory cells. Now, I do want to emphasize these cells. T regulatory cells are T cells that control uh, the affected T cells. So they reduce T cell activation. They keep the T cells under control. And the second pathway of interest here is the vitamin D pathway. So once vitamin D is uh, generated from uh, conversion in the skin and the kidney, the mature vitamin D acts on the dendritic cells I, I mentioned are the antigen presenting cells. And they also lead to induction of the T regulatory cells and are immunosuppressive. So these two pathways lead to immunosuppression in the skin. And this is just a higher power view showing you the cells. Vitamin D itself, so the reason we know that vitamin D will induce immunosuppression is lots of experiments have been done in the test tube. And when you add vitamin D to, um, to immune cells, they have the effects I just mentioned. They reduce dendritic cell activation uh, and they reduce T cell activation. And that's turned out to be really interesting in the context of multiple sclerosis or MS. Um, so the reason that that captured people's interest is if you look at the distribution of sunshine, obviously this is UV exposure is greatest around the equator. There's lots of sunshine there almost all year. And as you move uh, further away from the equator, and especially as you get above 40 degrees latitude, there's uh, ins insufficient sunshine for more than uh, six months of the year. And uh, people noticed, uh, people uh, studying multiple MS uh, re realized that there was a really interesting inverse correlation between UV exposure and the global distribution of MS. So as you move uh, further away from the equator and as you get to these areas that don't receive a lot of UVB, there's a much higher distribution uh, incidence of MS. Now, of course, there are a multitude of other reasons why people at different geographic sites might develop MS. Uh, clearly, there's a large genetic differences in these populations. But even in the very diverse uh, US populations, as you move further north, the incidence of MS is higher. So that remains a viable theory that um, UV, lack of UV exposure leads to reduced immunosuppression 
from the skin, that's especially vitamin D, and that in part might explain why people who are predisposed for other reasons might develop MS. Now, that really, uh, that, those ideas really became uh, very interesting and um, about 10 years ago, um, became a real uh, fad. That is, it, it was realized that people who uh, don't see much UV in the Northern hemisphere uh, have low levels of vitamin D in the blood. And it was proposed pretty much at that time that almost everybody should be taking vitamin D. So all of us during the winter months don't see a lot of sunshine here in Seattle. Our vitamin D levels are low. Uh, that has effects not only on, on immune function, but on bone function. So there was a huge rage for vitamin D therapy. Um, and pretty much everybody, uh, a lot of doctors were recommending that our patients should be taking vitamin D. But that, of course, became an important experiment to see whether the vitamin D therapy would reduce the incidence of MS. And so uh, there were a lot of clinical trials undertaken. But unfortunately, um, it soon became evident that people who were taking high dose vitamin D also developed uh, hypercalcemia. So a lot of these trials were aborted and it'd be only lower doses of vitamin D were administered and it, the, the effect became very murky. So I'm not going to really discuss that in much more detail. Um, so, but if you want to read about it, there are a number of articles written and I refer you to a, a recent article here uh, reviewing the progress in vitamin D therapy for MS. Okay, so another disease I want to talk about in relation to uh, UV exposure having a beneficial effect, and that is psoriasis. Again, many of you know that uh, patients with psoriasis are, are treated with PUVA, which essentially means that the patient takes sorolins to sensitize them to UV light. They th are then exposed to UV light, and in some patients, this has a dramatic effect. So. If you look at this slide, the patient before treatment has quite extensive, extensive inflammatory lesions around the knees. And after uh, courses of uh, PUVA, these lesions almost entirely are resolved. So the, exposure, the PUVA treatment is really beneficial. And the question is, how does that work? And based on what I've already told you about the normal response to UV light, you can see here that um, in the diagram that the UV light induces immunosuppressive cytokines such as IL-10 and IL-4. There is generation of these T regulatory cells that I talked to you about. And another really interesting effect is the UV light causes the migration of these uh, Langerhans cells out of the epidermis and out of the skin. And therefore you have a much lower level of antigen presenting cells so you don't present your self-damaged materials to you, your immune system. So there's a striking contrast here. Now I'm going to turn to talk about lupus. And I just you know told you how important sunlight can be in immunoregulation and suppressing immune function, but there's clearly something different in lupus. So if you look at this patient on the right with a typical malar rash in the sun exposed region, uh, that's one of the uh, giveaway clinical signs for lupus. Um, and then look at the patient on the left. What is really striking in this picture is the patient has a very intense uh, rash in the sun exposed region. She was, uh, had a V-shaped a, a, a sweater here and the regions were protected by her garments are completely protected from the, her skin rash. So sunlight is causing the skin rash only in the uh, exposed regions of the, of the body. So rather than having an immunosuppressive effect, you are having an immunoenhancing effect of sunlight. Now the skin is very important in lupus, uh, as again, many of you know, 
Um, we diagnose lupus by um, identifying four out of 14 criteria for uh, this disease. So most of those are clinical, but there are also some lab tests that we do to diagnose lupus. And if a patient has four of the 14 possible criteria, then we make a diagnosis of lupus. But, so what's interesting here is if you look at the, what the criteria are, at least four of these criteria involve the skin or mucous membranes. I showed you a picture of the malar, malar rash. I showed you a photosensitive rash. And then there's also a discoid rash and oral ulcers. And if you uh, include alopecia, which is also a very important uh, diagnostic feature in lupus, there really are five criteria out of 14 that involve skin or muc mucous membranes. So skin is very important in lupus. And not only uh, does it serve as a criterion, but photosensitivity is very common in lupus. In fact, if you ask uh, 100 lupus patients if their skin rash gets worse after exposure to sunlight, about 80% of them will tell you that uh, sunlight will make their, their either bring out the rash or make it worse um, at some time in their disease. And what's even more important is not only will sunlight make the skin rash uh, worse or bring it out, but it can cause systemic flares and it can even cause um, lupus, can precipitate um, lupus nephritis. So sunlight is really the only environmental factor that we know about that exacerbates lupus. So it's pretty important to figure out why that occurs. And I get, just to give you a little more background on lupus, one of the major breakthroughs that occurred about uh, 18 years ago uh, was this discovery here. So let me explain what this, this is a microarray which measures gene expression. I'm sure you've seen many of these before. If you add exposed blood cells to interferon, it induces the upregulation of about 200 genes in, in, in uh, blood cells. Um, and what you're seeing here, if you take um, the blood from a lupus patient, this upregulation of these interferon response genes, very high levels. Um, so that means that their blood cells have been exposed to interferon. And this was uh, replicated in, in many different studies and is a, is a key signature in uh, lupus. Um, the second feature I'd like to point out here is a, a signature of granulopoiesis, which is, um, means that there's activation and increase in immature neutrophils. And we'll come back to talk about that a little later. But let's talk about interferon from here on. So why, why do we pay so much attention to interferon? Uh, this is type one interferon. And as you know, as soon as you get a virus infection, this is the cytokine that is produced almost immediately. It's, uh, Inter type 1 interferon has a, an effect on all immune cells. So basically it's an alarm signal that the innate immune system uses to activate uh, the rest of the immune system and say, hey, wake up, we have something going on here. Go out and find out what it is and do something about it. So it's an extremely important uh, signal following virus infection and actually after some bacterial infections as well. Now about 70% of lupus patients, two or three quarters of lupus patients show this really profound interferon signature in their blood. And it's subsequently been found that this same interferon signature is also present in the skin and also in the kidney. So how do you put that all together in the pathogenesis of lupus? What, the central paradigm at the moment is, goes something like this. Maybe lupus patients have some type of chronic virus infection. Perhaps it's Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, perhaps it's a retro element. And you probably heard a talk by Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas Musselin in our division uh, who studies the role of, of retro elements in lupus. Uh, 
Maybe there's defective clearance of dying cells. We know for sure there is there are a lot of genetic variants in lupus patients leading to what we can just call for now immune dysregulation. So some combination of these factors then leads to production of interferon. And that in turn leads to that interferon spills over and it causes interferon signature in the blood, in the skin and in the kidney. So considering the importance of interferon and considering that um, uh, the sunlight is the only environmental factor that actually we know about in lupus, we asked the question, well, maybe could sunlight induce interferon and possibly explain worsening of lupus in uh, these patients? And to do that, we teamed up with Andrea Callis in Division of Dermatology. She has a machine called the Solar Simulator. And what that machine does is to, to uh, produce UV light uh, UVA and UVB at about the same proportions that occur uh, in sunlight. And then you can expose the uh, patient, the, I'd say a normal control here, to a very small area, about one square centimeter, to this UV light. Uh, you do have to induce a small a, uh, a degree of erythema, so the, the lesion goes red. And then what you, so basically here's the outline of the experiment. You expose the patient, to, sorry, this is all in normal controls. You expose the normal controls to um, UV light. You take a biopsy at baseline. And then again, at six hours and 24 hours after exposure. And we can ask the question as, as to whether exposure to sunlight induces interferon. And the answer is yes, a definite yes. Six hours after UV exposure, the, the skin cells are making a type 1 interferon, which we measure by an interferon score. And that persists at least for 24 hours. And there's a limit to how long we can actually take biopsies from these same patients. But we know that this lasts at least one or two days after exposure. So that clearly indicates that uh, environmental exposure to UV light can induce interferon. What is the significance of this finding? Well, we can't really address the mechanistic questions in humans because we can only do these uh, very small UV exposures, which is also called photo testing. And there's not a lot else we can do that's ethically feasible. So to answer the mechanistic questions, we set up a whole set of experiments. And I would like to mention here uh, the key postdoctoral fellow who do, did spearheaded most of this work was Slajana Scopilia Gardner did a fantastic job in addressing these questions that I'm going to show you now. So first, the question really is, can we use uh, mice as a model for, for humans? And you would think maybe not because the mice are hairy. So we can't just shine the same UV light on their skin. We have to shave their skin. But once we do that, we can, we can ask those same questions. Um, we can ask whether uh, female mice respond more than male mice. And the reason why that's interesting, because lupus is essentially a female disease. This occurs uh, at a ratio of about nine to one, nine women to one man. Um, so we can see if there are gender differences in the skin response. Um, we can ask if there's anything we can detect in the blood after UV light exposure. And then if we do detect interferon, we can ask, how does that happen? What, is the, what are the pathways that are activated following UV exposure? So I'm going to go through these uh, very uh, in, in short order and tell you what we found. So again, the experimental design here is very similar to uh, what we did in the humans. We take a biopsy before UV exposure. Um, and then at six and 24 hours after UV exposure, and we measure the interferon response. And again, we do that um, the same way we did before. So the results were really quite striking. What you see here is that UV light induces a very good uh, interferon response. So we can use the mouse uh, uh, for further experiments. 
the, the interferon response lasts for a couple of days. And what was really striking is that the female mice respond much better than do the male. So within six hours, there's almost no response in the male, but the, and the female is making um, about tenfold higher response as compared to the baseline. The males catch up, but they never really do as well as females. So uh, the mouse is a good model. We see some gender differences. And then we wanted to see whether there's anything we can detect going on besides in the skin. So to do that, um, we did ex essentially the same experiment, but here we are measuring the interferon response in blood. And um, again, there's a very striking interferon response in, in blood cells uh, that's about a hundredfold greater than the baseline. In, uh, I should say that all of the subsequent experiments were done in female mice. And again, that persists for a couple of days after a uh, UV exposure. Remember, this UV exposure is on the skin, and we're picking up the uh, response in blood. And again, why that's important is because once the blood cells, the, cell, the cells in the immune system are exposed to interferon, they get very activated. Now that's a good thing to happen after a virus infection, but if you can imagine persistent interferon exposure um, that's continually driving the activation of all these immune cells, you can begin to understand why uh, lupus patients get a, have a hyperactive immune system. And then the, the organ that we're most interested in lupus in, or most concerned about in lupus is of course the kidneys because glomerulonephritis is a major cause of, of death in patients, still remains a major cause of death. And so we're always interested in uh, immune effects on the kidney. So in those same mice that we exposed to UV light, we uh, took the kidneys from those animals after perfusing the animals to get rid of blood cells in the kidney and then asked whether we could detect an interferon response in the kidney. And indeed we do. These are the individual in interferon response genes that we pick up in the kidney. And you can see these are again very high after uh, 24 hours of skin exposure. So in summary here, um, we're getting a, a very good uh, systemic effects following skin exposure to UV light. And we have to wonder whether this central paradigm is the whole story that something's going on within the patient, maybe virus infection, inducing interferon and spilling over to the blood and kidney. Because we can now, we have evidence that if we expose this, if you expose the skin to uh, UV light, the skin makes interferon and that spills over into the blood and into the kidney. So the last part of this set of, set, set of mechanistic questions is we wanted to understand how that happens. How does UV light induce an interferon response? And um, just to remind you that uh, the UV light causes a lot of DNA damage, um, even if you don't get a, a major sunburn. There's induction of reactive oxygen intermediates which leads to oxidation of this DNA. And we know that um, this oxidized DNA can induce interferon through a number of different pathways. So let me introduce you here to these uh, red characters that are called DNA sensors. So these are, uh, cyto these are proteins in the cytoplasm that are there to detect DNA. The reason that there obviously is to pick up uh, DNA from viruses. There are also RNA, RNA sensors that pick up RNA from viruses. So they're basically a host defense mechanism that is primed to pick up nucleic acids that uh, are derived from viruses. So for reasons that I, I'm not don't have time to go into, we suspected that this particular DNA sensor, which does respond very well to oxidized DNA, could be involved for, uh, in the uh, immune response following uh, UV light.
And there's a very simple way in which we can test whether this particular uh, enzyme called CGAS is involved in the response to UV light. So fortunately for us, there are mice that have the gene encoding CGAS knocked out. So they are deficient in this DNA sensor. Um, and so we can simply compare the interferon response in normal or what we call wild type mice with the mice that have this, this gene, the C point protein, CGAS knocked out. And when we do that experiment, we find very interesting data, very informative data. So again, the normal mouse shown here in red produces the standard tenfold increase in uh, interferon response uh, early on. But the CGAS deficient animal does not produce any interferon at this time point. And um, that's equivalent to a mouse that cannot respond to interferon. Now, at, the, at later time points, there is some interferon produced, which means that CGAS is not the only in, uh, sensor for DNA, damaged DNA uh, at later time points. But at early time points, it, is the, it seems to be the only sensor involved in triggering this interferon response. Similarly, we could show that the same sensor was required for the UV-induced interferon response in the blood. And um, so what we think is going on here is that there is, um, following UV light, there's extensive keratinocyte cell death. There's damage to the DNA that leads to oxidized DNA. Um, that could be the trigger for CGAS activation. But I do want to mention another possibility because this is work done by uh, Christian Lewitt also in, in the Division of Rheumatology. He also did a, uh, a grand rounds a couple of months ago. And he, he has shown that uh, after neutrophils die uh, by, this, uh, by netosis, they also um, cause oxidation of uh, DNA, mitochondrial DNA. And this is also a very potent inducer and activator of the CGAS pathway. And uh, mentioning the neutrophils, this is also a segue to come back to the neutrophils because I've shown you that their UV light uh, causes activation of a cytokine pathway, which activates immune cells. But we also know that damage in lupus is mediated by cells and neutrophils are an important part of the inflammatory pathway. And the fact that we detect a granulopoiesis signature in, the, in lupus patients, and that this signature is very closely correlated with kidney disease makes this very interesting to us. So we decided to investigate the role of neutrophils as well following sunlight exposure. And I don't have time to go into this study in detail. So what I'm going to do here is to just briefly summarize the results of our study on neutrophils following the UV exposure. And again, this is of course, mostly done in mice. Um, and this is from an, um, a News and Views article on our paper published a couple of months ago. So when um, the mice are exposed to UV light, there is extensive cell death of the keratinocytes, as I've, I've mentioned. There's induction of, these, of a variety of cytokines that attract neutrophils to um, the lesions. Neutrophils come in, they help to clear up the debris. Some of the neutrophils will die at the site of inflammation, but some, interestingly enough, will undergo this, a subset of these neutrophils will undergo um, an interesting process of, of reverse migration. So it's a neutrophil reverse transmigration. They go back into the bloodstream. They have a distinctive phenotype. We can identify them. And some of these neutrophils go into the kidney. And the reason for that is we think the, the kidney, well, we've shown that the kidney upregulates adhesion molecules. And um, we can also show that if we deplete neutrophils, we can uh, avoid um, kidney damage. And just to um, convince the, any nephrologists that are on this uh, department of medicine, Grand Rounds, I do want to show you that 
there is damage to the kidneys, although all the experiments I've been showing you are in normal healthy uh, mice, except for the seagulls knockout. Uh, I do want to show you that they, the uh, UV light exposure, a single dose of UV light will induce proteinuria uh, around two to four days after exposure. There's also an increase in the albumin creatinine ratio here shown day four. And we can also demonstrate um, upregulation of these uh, damage markers in the kidney. So this is uh, upregulation of NGAL and KIM-1. So let me summarize um, these studies here. The single exposure to UV light, which is, some, which is fairly equivalent to the two MED doses we used in humans, causes significant uh, damage to uh, keratinocytes. It causes sunburst cells. It causes um, DNA damage um, and DNA oxidation. DNA oxidation will activate this uh, DNA sensor called CGAS, which in turn will activate this downstream pathway leading, leading to production of interferon. This interferon then causes its signature in the skin. It causes the interferon activation of genes in the blood and also the kidney. And then in a separate series of experiments, we've shown that the neutrophils, which, which really come in and cause sterile inflammation in the, in the skin, also get into the blood and get into the kidney. And they cause transient damage uh, in the kidney which we can prevent by depletion of neutrophils. So even though all of this work has been done in normal animals and normal humans, we think we have some mechanisms that could well explain why uh, exposure to sunlight can both activate a disease in the skin and also cause a uh, systemic disease flare. Of course, all of this remains to be proven in, um, you know, in lupus prone strains and in humans with lupus. Okay, so then you can ask me um, why, why do all this work unless something good comes of it? And I'm going to preempt some of your questions um, by say, because you could, a very good question will be, well, okay, so what? Lupus patients have been told by the Lupus Foundation to wear uh, big hats and to put on loads, loads of sunscreen. So you could just prevent all of the downstream effects by doing that. And while that is partly true, um, firstly, some patients forget or some patients don't actually want to do it um, and still get exacerbations of their skin disease or um, uh, systemic effects. And also, if we could prevent the skin activation in the lupus patients, but keep the immunosuppressive effects, we'd be doing the patients good. Also, when patients are don't get the benefits of sunshine, the metabolic benefits of sunshine, don't get the vitamin D, uh, that's not so good for their bones, especially when you consider that most of these lupus patients are taking corticosteroids which are also another hit to uh, bone health. So it seems like it would be better to do some, to think of some other things to do. Another thing you could say to me would be, well, why bother um, with trying to develop new therapies? Um, pharmaceutical companies have very recently made an anti a biologic that can block the interferon receptor. And in fact, that does improve skin disease. Uh, they, uh, other farmers have made um, small molecules that block jack stat pathways that are downstream of the interferon pathway. So here's the problem. That may be good for treatment for a short period of time, but who would like to take an interferon receptor blocker during a pandemic? Certainly I would not. Um, and while I think this still may hold off to be useful for therapy uh, later on when pandemic is over, it, we do know that actually administration of this drug does increase virus infections such as uh, herpes zoster. So we have to exercise some caution here. 
So we have concentrated on trying to make new therapies for to inhibit an upstream pathway of interferon. And obviously the obvious target here is the CS molecule I've been talking about. And just to emphasize, just to bring, just to emphasize that there would be two ways to do that. One is you could block the active site with a small molecule, or you could try and prevent the DNA from accessing the uh, enzyme. And I, I want to then tell you about the fun part, another fun part of medicine. So for those of you who uh, don't think that working in the ICU is, is what you want to do, I do want to tell you that there are other things to think about. And one of these things is um, making medicines at the University of Washington. And I want to just tell you how, give you some ideas on how to do that, or what we've done over the last couple of years. So the first thing you need to do is you need to find collaborators. And you've got to find collaborators that uh, can do the things you can't do. And fortunately, the University of Washington has lots of potential collaborators. So we in the department, members of the Department of Medicine have collaborated with uh, scientists in pharmaceutics and medicinal chemistry and chemistry and microbiology to form a small mini pharma team. And the first thing you need to do is to look at your molecule and preferably if you can get a crystal structure of your molecule, you can start to think of how you might find new targets. So here is the crystal structure of sea gas. You can see the D, this is the, it's a, it's a, it forms a dimer, so the two monomers. And here is the DNA that when it interacts with the sea gas uh, molecule, will cause a conformational change and activate the molecule. So you look at that molecule, or you ask your computer modelers to look at that uh, molecule and look at some chemical structures and tell you which ones might actually interfere with the uh, interaction of the DNA with the sea gas. And fortunately, we have uh, two good people who worked with us on this, so uh, Mark Miney and Abby Knapp, came up with some chemical structures that would be predict predicted to inhibit the DNA interaction with the sea gas molecule. So once they come up with um, uh, compounds that they think might be useful, uh, Tomi Sasaki in chemistry then makes these molecules and uh, Josh Woodward has devised some really uh, neat tools to look to see whether those uh, chemicals inhibit sea gas, some very sensitive uh, readouts. And then the rest of us test these uh, compounds in mice. So that's the pathway to uh, making drugs in a very simple way. And then of course you have to test them. So we did in fact come up with uh, a, a molecule that we thought would be very good. We call it X6, but we had to find a mouse model to test it in. So coming back to um, so we're obviously working on a molecule that blocks sea gas. And there is a mouse model that we could use to test the chemical compound. So just to give you a little background here, I told you that we get uh, DNA in, uh, in, the, in our cells. It can come from viruses. It can come from mitochondrial DNA. It can come from um, other retro element DNA. But there's an enzyme that cleans up this DNA that gets into the cytosol. And this enzyme is called TREX1. Now, there are actually humans who have mutations in TREX1. In fact, 1% to 2% of lupus patients have mutations in TREX1. And what happens then, of course, is if this enzyme is not working, you have accumulation of DNA. You have too much DNA. This activates sea gas, and this causes... Um, a severe disease in mice uh, that's equivalent of a disease called a Cardi Gutierrez syndrome. So this became a very good uh, mouse model for us to test our drug. And in fact, we were quite successful. So we were able to use this drug called uh, X6 to inhibit C gas activity. Um, this drug actually is a derivative of an anti-malarial drug, and it, co it caused a striking reduction in sea gas activation in these sea gas uh, mice and caused some improvement in their clinical symptoms. 
So that's um, about all I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to give you a, a summary of this, this, this talk. Uh, so I think I've, I hope I've convinced you that sunlight has multiple effects on the skin. And of course, we literally just touched the surface. But it's important to note that depending on the wavelength, uh, the wavelength, the dose and duration of the UV exposure, as well as a host of susceptibility factors, which again, we've, we've hardly touched upon, UV light can either cause immunosuppression or immunostimulation. In lupus, the UV light induces many inflammatory pathways in the skin. Um, it induces type 1 interferon, and, it, and that occurs not only in the skin, but in the blood and kidney. I've also told you that neutrophils accumulate in the skin, and some reverse migrate back into the blood and systemic organs, including the kidney. And we've defined we, a, a molecular pathway, CGAS, that is uh, necessary to uh, make interferon very early after sunlight exposure. And that provides us then with uh, a new target for uh, therapy. So uh, the conclusion of the talk is, and this is mainly addressed to the residents and fellows, that sleuthing the molecular mechanisms of disease can be both rewarding and fun. I encourage you to form your own mini pharma at UW, and hopefully this would be another way you can do good for your patients. So uh, I want to just acknowledge my collaborators here. Again, a, a huge amount of the work here was done by, or was led by um, a postdoc, Slajana Skopelia Garna, with uh, help and interaction with many lab members. We've had collaborations with uh, individuals within rheumatology, dermatology, immunology, and all these other team members I mentioned. Um, and uh, had funding support. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, really, really interesting talk. A couple of questions that came in, but I might start by going back to sort of in how you were defining the difference in the gender, specifically in mice, uh, between the interferon response to light. Do you have any thought to why there is that gender discrepancy? Yeah, this is clearly something we are planning to investigate um, you know, it's easy to blame estrogens, <laughs> and there are some ways in which you can, we can speculate that estrogens could influence that response, and of course it is, again, somewhat, you know, it is easy to test that, the role of estrogens in animals, and this is something we plan to do. Um, but there are other factors that have also been, um, there are certain molecules that seem to be upregulated in um, females as compared to males. Uh, there's a certain transcription factors that may not be um, estrogen dependent that have been identified in females and they do seem possibly to be UV related um, and they are candidates, but we haven't studied them yet. Um, another question that came up sort of more related to some of those last slides where you're talking about uh, an anti-malarial derivative that you you all were studying. It struck a, a few folks um, that hydroxychloroquine is used to treat lupus. And is this maybe a, a, a similar mechanism on the sea gas pathway that's being uh, harvested or sorry, utilized there? Yes. Um, we actually think that is probably the case. The anti-malarials, um, will actually block the nucleic interactions with another set of receptors as well, called the toll-like receptors. Um, and we've shown that they will also inhibit the um, interaction of nucleic acids with the C-gas. This occurs at fairly high concentrations, but the antimalarial type drugs are concentrated in cells. And in fact, they don't work very quickly. They take about uh, three or four weeks to work. And we think that's because you need to accumulate high doses of these drugs in the cells. And um, we do think that is one way in which <clears throat> that set of molecules can actually are useful in lupus. So this derivative can do better. <laughs> it can can get... Yeah, we've shown that in, at least in the test tube uh, and in, in that mouse model that this derivative was better. 
but we hope, um, yeah, we hope to improve on it further. A couple of questions came in regarding sort of vitamin D, sunlight, and not just autoimmunity, but uh, immune effect against infection. So um, vitamin T sort of suppressing the Th1 response, but uh, that a Th1 response is important in the eradication of tuberculosis. And yet um, sometimes we see associations between vitamin D and an improved enhanced defense against TB. I think a similar corollary, of course, COVID has its way into everything, but we were we were talking a lot about vitamin D and sunlight in, in terms of um, the, the severity of COVID infection as well. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, well, yeah. so let me talk about the COVID because I know a little bit more about that. Um, so it's, seems to me, and it's, this is mostly from reading the literature, is that the acute interferon response, and also looking at the mouse models, the acute interferon response is really important for um, protection. And in fact, a lot of people think that the, one of the reasons that the kids don't get such severe COVID infection is because they produce a huge innate immune response, which is dominated by interferon, especially maybe interferon in the airways. So an acute early high interferon response seems, seems to be quite protective. On the other hand, if you make a feeble interferon response and you get the more severe systemic forms at that point, there's some evidence that the interferon can be banned and along with the other um, the cytokines, the IL-6 and so on. So I think it's a, it's a two-phase thing, and I, I'd love to see some more research on the early interferon response in kids. But the problem is by the time they're often seen, the firstly, they are often not because they clear so efficiently. And then the, maybe the few who get this really uh, severe cytokine storm have some deficiencies. Um, yeah, and also just to mention, actually, the very nice work done at the Rockefeller showing that you have those individuals who have antibodies to interfere on get much more severe COVID infections. Hmm. So just highlighting the importance of the acute interferon response in, yeah. um, and, and I guess I wonder if the sunlight is ramping up that interferon response and it may have nothing to do with the vitamin D sort of in, that, in the defensive aspect. Yeah, all right. So it'd be interesting to try and uh, dissociate those two phenomena. Exactly. Um, a question about sort of just a couple questions about the way the cascade of events um, between the skin cell death and the systemic autoimmunity. So is there some underlying genetic predisposition? Are there acquired defects or why? Um, why do some people develop that systemic inflammation and some people don't in response to, you know, such a common exposure like UVB? Yeah. Yeah, we did quite a bit of research earlier on, on clearance of dendrine cells. And there's fairly good evidence that lupus patients have poor clearance of dendrine cells. That's partly related to complement components that tend to be low, uh, particularly C3 and uh, C4. Those are important for clearance of dead and dying cells. So, you know, if those dead and dying cells stick around more, the cells burst open, they release necrotic material, which is very inflammatory. And that is, at least there's some evidence to suggest that that is um, operative in lupus patients. It's kind of difficult to do the kind of experiment you want to do, which is to measure clearance in, the, in lupus patients. There's a little bit of evidence that may be um, abnormal uh, damage. A little bit of evidence, again, cell damage is under investigated area in lupus. Um, the other problem is, you know, in lupus patients, you already have antibodies present and they probably amplify some of this uh, inflammation. So there's a lot going on. Um. A question about whether UV-induced uh, keratinocyte death is occurring through a P53 dependent pathway or whether you know exactly the pathway by which those that cell death is induced. Yeah, we think that probably that in lupus patients, is, it has been studied to some extent and the P53 response appears to be normal. 
In fact, so we're thinking that most of the cell, there, you know, most of those sunburst cells are occurring in, normally uh, in the pathways are probably normal in the lupus patient. And it's probably more of the problem related to clearance of the material. Um, a question about whether you could comment on the regulatory mechanisms to control type one interferon responses and what maybe is um, underlying why that is different during UV exposure. Yeah. Um, the regulation is quite complex, but the we can to some extent explain why lupus patients do make a heightened immune response, uh, interferon response. They have um, gene variants um, that um, d allow for higher responses. So for example, there are some genetic variants in the toll-like receptor pathways that lead to enhanced responses to exposure to nucleic acids. There are some variants in that, if you remember the downstream pathways I mentioned, the JAK-STAT signaling pathways, lupus patients have more variants in those pathways that lead to increased interferon responses. Um, the, the ways in which um, interferon is, um, there, there's a little bit of data in the receptor itself, although I don't think that's rewarded tight. Um, but there, like I say, there is good evidence that the lupus patients make a heightened interferon response uh, following exposure to nucleic acids. Uh, interferon is, you know, degraded by a whole variety of different ways on I mean, its SOX pathways, and there are many genes that are involved in proteins that are involved in regulation in degradation of the interferons. And then um, another question was, you know, you very well demonstrated the, the migration, potentially the neutrophils to the kidney and the upregulation of in, uh, interferon in, in that tissue as a systemic response to UV light. Are there any other organs in which we've been able to see that similar response to yeah. UV light? So yeah, I didn't have time to mention it, but we did always do the lung as a control. And interestingly enough, there were a different set of adhesion molecules upregulated in the lung, and there wasn't as much neutrophil inf infiltration into the lung. So we always had that as a control. So we do think there's something different and interesting going on in the kidney as compared to the lung. Mm. Now we didn't do as sophisticated tests in the lung, you know, for album, albumin leakage or something like that. So I can't completely rule out the fact that there is uh, subclinical damage, but um, we certainly did show that there was a relative increase in the damage in the neutrophil migration to the lung, uh, to the kidney. So, so, so it seems to be unique to this to the kidney and the adhesion molecules that are upregulated there. Yeah. Specific question, a subset of that was regarding central nervous system or neural lupus. Yeah. Uh, oh, did it go into the did, brain? Did it go into the brain? Uh, we, uh, yeah, we did not. It's a, yeah, we, we should have studied the brain because we're very interested in that question. There's a lot of discussion about the effect of interferon in the brain. And in fact, that disease I mentioned to you, a cardiogutier syndrome, uh, interferon is produced in the brain, and it's a dreadful disease. The children uh, develop uh, mental retardation, motor, motor um, function disorders, and uh, about 30% of those kids die from the, their brain disease by the age of 15. It's a dreadful disease, and it's predominantly due to too much interferon in the brain. Now, in lupus, that's been postulated. There's also a um, possibility of interferon production in the brain, but <clears throat> as you can imagine, incredibly difficult to study. Almost, it's almost impossible to study uh, these days. Um, and then a question regarding, you know, does the skin tone affect some of these responses, both in terms of the amount of um, interferon response or uh, even beyond that, how much UV light is required to sort of precipitate this? Yeah, it does. You know, I guess where I need the old time uh, grain rounds there, and I call on my colleague, Andrea Callister, <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> 
better than I can, but uh, there's certainly differences in the um, amount of UV light you have to give to each individual person to get that minimal erythematic dose. So yes, people do respond very differently to the same dose of UV light. Um, and then sort of final question here, any thoughts on, uh, on whether this uh, physiology or this pathophysiology may be linked to the increase in the development of cardiovascular disease in patients with lupus? That's an interesting question. Um, that, and I'd say yes. And the reason I say that is because um, another colleague at NIH, uh, Mariana Kaplan, has done some beautiful work showing that interferons are, type one interferons are very important in uh, vascular damage. And um, the chronicity of that occurring in loops patients uh, almost certainly contributes to some of the vascular disease that we see in lupus patients, especially, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the chronic vascular damage we see, possibly leading to atherosclerosis. So um, I would say yes, although I don't have my own data to support that. But Mariana Kaplan has done some really nice work on that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for an excellent presentation and for sticking around to answer a lot of questions, obviously a lot of interest from the audience. So um, really wonderful thought talk. And uh, thank you everyone who stuck around and um, have a great, wonderful rest of your Friday and weekend. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. You're done. <laughs>